Okay, uh, hi everyone. I'm Sammy from Square Books. I'm the events coordinator. Um, we're really excited to bring y'all this event tonight. Um, we have David Hill here to talk about his book, The Vapors, and Jay Jennings from the Oxford American is here in conversation with him. Um, in the chat, I am going to put a link uh, to where you can buy the book directly from us with a signed book plate. Um, and as you're listening, feel free to start uh, submitting any questions you may have. Um, and David and Jay are going to go over your questions at the end. Um, I'm going to disappear. Uh, enjoy the rest of the event. Thanks and welcome. Welcome, everybody. Uh, we're here to talk with David Hill about his fantastic book, The Vapors. And uh, um, I was called in because I'm a hot springs of file, uh, <laughs> if I may describe myself that way. I've um, written a lot about hot springs over the years, uh, mostly sports related, um, stuff, but, um, have a long history with the, the town. Uh, it's not a city as we learn at the, at the end of the book, but, uh, um, my parents were frequent, uh, uh, they were frequent attendees at the horse races there and at the casinos when the casinos were operating. Um, had a condo on the lake and uh, I, was, uh, I was just thinking about how uh, Hot Springs is really one of the most fascinating places in America that's been underexplored, I think, as a, uh, in, in, a lot of its layers, um, including the literal sedimentary layers of uh, of, of the uh, geology and, and uh, bathhouses that sprung up there, tourism, gambling, um, uh, and I learned so much reading uh, David's book uh, that I didn't know about hot springs and, and considered myself a uh, an expert. So. Um, it's written with great uh, affection for all of the people there, even the gangsters and the uh, uh, David's own family who uh, who lived there and and worked there. And uh, it, it's really a, a portrait of just a a fascinating place at a fascinating time in uh, in American history uh, that involves. Uh, you know, religion, race, uh, all of the, all of the issues that, uh, that we in America are still, uh, still exploring today. So, um, uh, I'll start by, uh, uh, by showing you my, my official hot springs bathers, uh, Jersey that I, uh, <clears throat> got from Ebbets Fields flannels. And then they had it, uh, there in honor of, uh, Jim Tugerson or the Tugerson brothers who were the first uh, black players to play in the Cotton States League um, and uh, as, you, as you can imagine that was uh, that caused um, some uh, uh, attention to uh, to come to Hot Springs at that time. So um, thank you all for coming and uh, just want to start off by uh, asking David, like, uh, you know, there's so much, uh, research in the book. Um, can you, uh, including, uh, FOIA requests and, uh, you know, transcripts from FBI informants and tapes that, that really, um, give the book some, uh, some depth, uh, because the, the world uh, that you're exploring is not one that often appears in, official histories or uh, in newspapers. And so uh, the, the difficulty of telling a story about a, a uh, of crime and, 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 and sort of underworld uh, is, um, is a difficult one. I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about the, the, the research you did and, and how you got to some of these stories and how you tried to verify some of the stories. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you're right that it's to, so I point out that when you're writing about crime, it's a it's tougher 
um, because people who are engaged in crime actually, it, they intentionally try to like obscure what they're doing, right? So there's not as much of a written record. There's not as many primary sources that you can really trust or rely on. And, you know, that made it very difficult. Um, you know, for Hot, for Hot Springs, they spent the better part of, you know, a half a century um, covering up this crime, right? And so what sort of survives is a lot of local lore and a lot of kind of stories, folklore that had been passed on from generation to generation. And, um, and I grew up there, so I was, little, I was steeped in that folklore. And I also spent a lot of time reading the kind of the, the literature that already exists on Hot Springs. Um, but I did, I did want to kind of go deeper and a step further. And, um, and so, yeah, FOIAing Department of Justice and FBI files helped a lot. But also getting a chance to interview people like um, Dane Harris's daughter, or, you know, people who were, or um, uh, Q. Byram Hurst's son, people who were the children of the folks that I was writing about who were able to tell me some stories that maybe didn't make it into some of these, um, some of these histories. But um, I've been joking lately about how as much as it was a violation of Dane and Oni and everybody's civil rights for the FBI to be secretly recording them all this time, as a writer, I really appreciated it because <laughs> it gave me a lot of good stuff for the book because I had dialogue that was real dialogue, right? I didn't have to invent it. I was able to take um, take conversations out of these files that had been transcribed. And so that, you know, I think that made the book feel a little bit more, it, you know, I hope it made the book feel richer that that I was able to um, to have those kinds of vivid scenes that, you know, where people are actually in conversation with each other and there's some back and forth dialogue. Because um, I really wanted the book to feel more you know, like I wanted to feel more like narrative history than, you know, kind of like scholarly history because I'm not a historian. <laughs> right. right. Can, can you just describe for those who, who might not have uh, read the reviews of the book or, or might not be as familiar with it, the three threads of the uh, stories that you're sure. trying to tell and how those, um, how those are structured in the book? Yeah, so I, you know, I wanted to try to, I knew I wanted to write a book about Hot Springs, but I'm not really a historian and I, and I wanted to have kind of a, a personal way to tell the story, right? But I'm also not from a family that's an important family in the history of Hot Springs either. So, um, so what I sort of landed on was to tell three, the story of three people's lives that, and these three people sort of represented these different, I guess, layers of the um, of the gambling business in Hot Springs. And so the first is my grandmother who arrives in Hot Springs in the early 1930s as a teenager, whose her father was a horse trainer and she, he follows the circuit and she shows up with him and then she decides to stay and get married. Uh, the second person is Oni Madden who is a fairly well-known um, uh, mobster. He's a British gangster that was a crime boss in New York City, ran the Cotton Club. He um, he managed a lot of famous uh, boxers and movie stars and um, was a pretty powerful crime figure in New York. He comes to Hot Springs around the same time as my grandmother in the early 1930s after prison stint. And he sort of becomes the like the mobs man in Hot Springs. And then the third person is a man named Dane Harris, who was a local guy who um, was the son of a bootlegger who kind of grew up in um, the area and rose the ranks, so to speak, sort of economic, political, and political ranks to become the boss gambler, the kind of boss of the town. And so I tell their three stories over the span of these 40 years, and they, they are all sort of on parallel tracks for a good part of the book, but they intersect at this briefly at this club called The Vapors that Dane built in 1959. And The Vapors is, um, you know, it's kind of a literal and figurative flashpoint for the gambling business in Hot Springs. It's these, it's the crown jewel, like centerpiece of a large, wide open gambling operation in the city. Um, it's a, you know, it's a, a, a pretty, it was a pretty well-known club, but it also was a, there was a, a lot of kind of back and forth. Um, there was like an inner scene kind of war going on around the club as well. So those, uh, what I really loved about the, uh, about the story of your family and how it's, uh, integrated into the the story of Hot Springs is that uh, I had, uh, you know, read about Oni Madden and uh, Dane Harris and they were, you know, and other other figures like uh, Q. Byram Hurst and, and Orville Faubus, political figures and, and the roles they played, Sid McMath. And um, 
but I think what your your mother your grandmother's story adds to the to it is that there's uh, a whole uh, other class of people in Hot Springs who are uh, in some ways affected by the gambling uh, industry uh, of the town and also by the uh, and also not affected by it in that they are you know not uh, uh, they service the high rollers and the people who come to visit the, the city they're not they don't necessarily um, you know, enjoy the fruits uh, of the of the gambling business in the way that uh, that some others do. So uh, there, there's a really fascinating uh, social uh, pinballing going on in in the city between all of these different classes of people, from uh, you know out of town mobsters to local politicians to um, the ordinary people who. Uh, drive the cabs and the uh, milk trucks, and uh, uh, so the what comes out of it is a whole, you know, a whole spectrum of life in this uh, in this very unusual town. Um, did you did you start out uh, your work thinking that you would tell those three stories, or did it emerge uh, with the writing? Yeah, I mean, it was in the proposal. I proposed that I would tell it this way with these three stories, but how, you know, I think that in the writing, I definitely discovered some things that I went in some directions that I didn't anticipate going, that's for sure. And some of what you're talking about now about, you know, the, that, that balance between kind of the powerful and, the, um, and then the sort of, you know, the, the powerful and the proletariat of, of Hot Springs, that, that really came out in the writing. I really didn't, I didn't, initially realized how much I would lean into that. But there were moments when I was re researching it where, I mean, I think the moment that I remember really feeling like, feeling powerfully that this was important was when I read that, the quote that I use in the book where the UPI reporter is on his way out of town after having a big night gambling at the Vapors and he asked the, his gas station attendant what he thinks of the whole thing and the guy's like, He's like, I don't care. Like they make all the money, you know, I don't, I don't make anything. They, you know, they're, they're getting rich and we're, I'm here pumping gas. And I remember reading that quote in that article and feeling like, you know, this is important, right? That, that, it, that here I am trying, I'm celebrating this and, and kind of lamenting the fact that, that it was all, that it all, you know, went to ruin. Um, but I thought, you know, it's also important that I should show how there was a bit of ruin at the, you know, there was an underbelly to it as well. And, you know, my grand my grandparents story lended itself to that pretty well and i i didn't know how much i really when i set out to write i did not know how much tragedy there would be in 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 my family story i knew there were some you know i knew some of the uh i knew some of it but i didn't know all of it and i think the experience of interviewing everybody and the longer i spent with people the more they would kind of open up and tell me and the more tragic it all became so i even when i proposed this book i didn't get how much hazel's part of the story would be you know, would I didn't realize just how tragic it would be. Yeah, they're all, uh, you know, we all have our uh, ideas about what a mobster is or what a, a gambling impresario is, but the, I think the complexity of the characters of both Oni Madden and Dane Harris really, uh, you know, strips away um, all stereotypes and, uh, uh, you know, there's plenty of violence, and uh, and some of the most shocking violence comes from within your family. I'm I'm, uh, I'm sorry to say, but the the um, the there was one uh, quote in the book that struck me by the um, I think it was a writer from Life magazine who was uh, who was doing a trip across Arkansas and stopped in Hot Springs and. And he said, uh, unlike Las Vegas, it looks like these people in Hot Springs are having fun gambling. And uh, I know that was always my parents' uh, experience with gambling. It was, it was fun for them. And uh, the, uh, you know, it, they had a, uh, there was a, 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 a slot machine brand called Jennings and they, 
bought a slot machine and had one in their lake house there uh, just because it had the, had the name there. And it was, um, it was always sort of a pastime rather uh, for them and for a lot of Arkansans of, the, uh, you know, of their uh, upper middle class uh, state to uh, just go and have a good time and have some drinks and uh, see a, a New York caliber show and, uh, you know, maybe lose a couple hundred dollars, but that was the cost of admission. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that writer at the time was, you know, he's really comparing what he saw in the casinos of Hot Springs to what he had seen in the casinos of Las Vegas. And at that particular time, Las Vegas was not the Las Vegas we know today. You know, Las Vegas was mostly what we would call sawdust joints. You know, it was, um, there was definitely a lot of casinos there. And, uh, you know, some of them were a little glitzier than others. But on, on you know, on average, the, the Las Vegas was still a bit of a seedy place. You know, it was... Uh, still in the middle of nowhere, you know, it didn't have a, really much of a city to it. There was no sewer. I think I write in the book about how, you know, there were no street lights and there were very few paved roads and the casinos there were really kind of like, um, they were places you went to do serious gambling, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think that writer was talking about how Hot Springs felt like it was fun, like it was more resort. And I think that, you know, one of the things that I I think my book tries to argue that I think might be new to this conversation about Hot Springs is that, you know, that was a moment where Hot Springs was sort of in the running to be Las Vegas, right? Like Las Vegas was sort of being floated as a recipient of the Teamsters pension funds money and a place where they could develop, where the mob could develop post Cuba, post Havana, which was sort of where they were investing their money, that Hot Springs could have been a recipient of that. And that it was the politics and the infighting and a lot of other things that were going on at that time that caused Hot Springs to miss its moment and for Hot, and then for Las Vegas to end up sort of benefiting from that. And so in a weird way, the history of Las Vegas is tied to the history of Hot Springs because uh -huh. Hot, Las Vegas benefited from people in Hot Springs not having their act together. <laughs> and, and of course now in, uh, in Hot Springs, there's a sort of resurgent uh, casino-like gambling uh, movement going on, um, and so the the book seems uh, sort of a you know preview, really, of of uh, of what went away and is now is now seeming to come back. It, it, it really is all across the South. You know, uh, casino gambling has uh, been an economic engine for a lot of places that are steeped in in poverty and hot springs really uh you know didn't didn't have a, the reputation as a place where there was you know horrible poverty um it, it's always been kind of a re resort town where where visitors uh you know go to have a good time um but but i think one of the revelations for me was uh about uh, the different constituencies that were sort of fighting for power in Hot Springs. Um, can you can you talk a little bit about the role of religion? Uh, I mean, the, uh, Hot Springs and uh, Arkansas, and uh, you know, is part of the Bible Belt, and there uh, there was a real um, a, a, a movement among uh, certain religious denominations to, uh, to, to end, you know, the, the Sin City aspect of, of Hot Springs. And, yeah. and in some ways, it seems like that is what doomed uh, gambling in the end. It was the, it was the one of the final nails that, uh, uh, that, that happened to end gambling in Hot Springs. Right, and I mean, you may you may know some of this history better than I do, even. But I this whole, the churches united against gambling, the like coalition of religious groups that formed to take on gambling in Hot Springs. I mean, they weren't Hot Springs churches, right? I mean, the 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 clergy in Hot Springs had always tolerated it, and you know had sort of um, uh, benefited from it in some ways because they received money from the you know casino operators and um, their congregants supported it. And I tell the story early in the book about. Uh, pastor who comes to a church from out of town and he starts preaching against gambling and 
he starts getting death threats and his congregants are leaving and the police tell him he should probably leave town and so he does <laughs> so like hot springs is clergy were you know they they had a, they were not anti-gambling but around the rest of the state they were and you know my sense of my the way i read the history is that i felt like the, that the the churches united against gambling coalition was a bit insincere i mean i think that um it was a cudgel that they used against Fabus, right? That there was so there was such an anti fabus um, sort of m movement afoot, and uh, it was just it became one issue. And I sh I say one. I mean, really, it was liquor and gambling. They kind of conflated the two, but because um, at the time, even though liquor was legal, it was illegal to sell liquor by the glass, right? So that was another thing going on in Hot Springs that was scandalous. Was that not only were we gambling in the open, but uh, we were serving liquor by the glass in restaurants and bars and that was just as you know that was scandalous so i think that um that it became a cudgel that they used against Fabus to sort of run run you know they wanted to use it to run Fabus out of office and um in the end it was rockefeller really i mean rockefeller just he was the one that decided to put the final nail in the coffin and you know i i i'm not sure that rockefeller's decision because i guess the book ends a little bit before i mean i talk about this in the prologue a little bit but Gambling ends when uh, the real official end of gambling, when the casino owners finally willingly decided to close up the last remnants of the business, was when the state legislature finally passed a bill to legalize gambling in Arkansas. And I, I believe this would have been 1968. And they passed a, uh, they passed a bill. It, they had tried several times to pass it, it failed. They tried statewide referendums that had failed. And so the story that I was told was that, um, was that Hearst, had Senator Hearst went and bought all his votes for a thousand dollars a vote and he passed the bill and they had a promise from Rockefeller that if they passed it he just wouldn't do anything and his inaction would have allowed it to pass if he didn't veto it in five days and on the fourth day at like midnight he vetoed it and I'm not sure that his decision to veto it was because of religion or because of pressure he was getting from the religious uh community in Arkansas um I think that uh I suspect he was probably getting some pressure from his brother and from other interests. And I think that one of the things that Dane Harris was saying till the day he died was that it was, it were, it was the political pressure that came from the Teamsters Union, from, you know, wow. gambling interests in other states that really, you know, that they called in uh, uh, the, the Rock, you know, Governor Rockefeller from New York, and that they put a lot of pressure on him to like not allow this to happen, to be competition for them. I mean, you know, I don't have any, evidence that's what happened but I suspect it could be true I mean especially given that like you know Rockefeller had already won and wasn't going to be challenged by you know he'd already won won his election I'm not sure that he would have needed to placate further those church leaders I'm not even sure that they supported him I mean I don't know this is an interesting question because my book didn't go that far into the history so I didn't delve that deep into it but I'm not sure that the like conser religious conservatives were a big part of Rockefeller's uh, mm -hmm. coalition that he used to beat Fabus, or he didn't beat Fabus, but to to right. beat the Democrats when he finally became governor. Yeah, can you talk a little bit about Hot Springs? Uh, I was I was also surprised and to find uh, connections between Hot Springs and Cuba. Um, yeah, as uh, you know, we we tend to forget that Cuba was a well, you know pre Castro was a was a big tourist destination for for a lot of Americans, but yep. particularly for uh, for the gambling industry. Can you just talk about that connection? Well, I was surprised to discover it myself. I mean, it was something that really came up in the research, and uh, and I was so excited when I started realizing that, that the, these connections were there. I mean, you know that um, that uh, the story about Oni Madden and Meyer Lansky taking all the local casino owners down to Cuba to study and to learn how to run a casino, um, that they um, went down there to kind of see how things were run, but also how like after the revolution, I'd, I had read this course, you know, I was able to get up my hands on some of um, Dane's personal correspondence and files and I was able to find these letters about how, you know, people like local folks that were part of the gambling operation were, I mean, they, the Cuban, the revolutionaries in Cuba flew them you know they flew from arkansas to cuba to stay in the havana hilton and be their guests and just to check in to make sure that everything's okay and it you know that because the the revolutionaries after the revolution the um the revolutionaries tried to run the casinos they didn't close them all down right they thought well 
it, it took a while before they decided to shut them down, but immediately after the revolution, they, they took them over and tried to run them and, and keep them operating and make money. And they failed miserably. They lost tons of money. And, um, and that's when they shut them down. So I think there was an effort by the revolutionaries to bring in some gamblers to come and check in on them to see if they were doing everything correctly, right? But, but yeah, I thought that was all fascinating to see the connections between these like local Arkansans and um, this world historic event that was happening in Cuba, yeah. but it was, it was happening. And it, I think it speaks to how interconnected Hot Springs was to, you know, I mean, its role in the gambling industry meant that it had an important role in, um, in a much broader, uh, um, in a much broader sense, a much a larger role in American politics and life. Because at that time, I mean, in 1960, you know, organized crime was really running America in a lot of ways. And it, it, political corruption was rampant across the country at every level of government and American public life. I mean, you know, the, um, you know, the Kennedy election in 1960 was, you know, I mean, there were so many forces at play in that election that had nothing to do with actual voters, but had everything to do with like this, like mob family versus this mob family in this state. And, uh, and so, you know, the things, I think there was a real crisis in America with, and this is what Robert Kennedy, when he was the AG, was trying to take on was what he saw as being a real crisis in, of corruption that was caused by organized crime. And so Hot Springs played a role in that. It was not a, it was a, not a major role, but not a minor one either. I think Hot Springs, Arkansas was an in, integral part of this $9 billion a year gambling business that fueled organized crime. And even though, you know, these like local boys were running these, um, casinos in Arkansas, they were still, you know, kicking up to these people and they were a part of it. They were a part of that economy and they were a part of the bigger picture. And that's why after the revolution, they were involved in those conversations. Right, right. The, and, and a part of the, the gambling business that I'd been uh, sort of ignorant of before I read the book was uh, the wire services. Mm -hmm. And um, which is really, sounds like how Oni Madden, you know, was was uh, the role he was playing in Hot Springs, and I'm I'm old enough to remember when the, the Sting came out, which, yeah. uh, which is <laughs> that story. But can can you talk a little bit about you know the wires and how important they were to the gambling operations in Hot Springs? Yeah, so the 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 race wire was really essentially a, a dedicated sort of network of um in, of information to get race results over Western Union's wires to places around the country so that they could have instant race results. And so all that sounds very rudimentary and, and you know, to us today because we're so used to instant information, but that was an incredibly valuable resource because prior to having access to telegraph lines, um, get, people who bet on races had to wait until the next day's newspapers came out to see whether or not their bet won. And so, once you were able to get the results instantly, you could actually book a bet. You know, you could open up a shop and book bets all day long on every race instantly. People, you'd, you know, take bets and pay them out right after the race was over. And then you'd start taking bets on the next one and, you know, just increase the volume that you could do and it changed the business. So control of this race wire was a highly contested thing. And, um, you know, the, the initial race wire was sort of, it was developed by uh, Annenberg, Moses Annenberg, who was a newspaper sort of, you know, magnate, but he was the one that sort of, um, sort of came up with this idea that, you know, that this was valuable, but all of this was on the sneak. I mean, you know, it wasn't like there was an actual wire that went around the country. It was just sort of a, a series of people getting paid off from this place to this place to make sure that these results would get, you know, would get transmitted through different offices around the country, right? So as long as they had an office in this city and an office in this city, they, had, they knew there was one wire, one telegraph kind of line that they could utilize to connect those two cities. They could, they could wire the whole country. It was like an internet, right? And, um, and so the, the mob went to war with Annenberg over control of this. And they, it was a bloody war that they fought to get control of it. And they finally did get control of the major wire. And then they used it as a way to get control of gambling operations around the country. And so in hot, once the mob got control of the wire, they kind of gifted Oni Madden, you know, that, that privilege in Hot Springs, they said, you know, because at the time, Oni Madden's like control over the casinos he had interest in was being fought. He was fighting with this other, this local judge over, um, 
his, his ability to stay in control. So the mob get, gifted him the wire and he was able to use the wire to exert some power and control in Hot Springs because everybody needed it. Everybody needed access to information and they had to go through Oni Madden to get it. And so, you know, it's just, it was little things like that. I mean, it was the same thing in the, on the West Coast, Bugsy Siegel used the wire to take control of Los Angeles and then Las Vegas. I mean, you know, the simple little thing like controlling the telegraph wire that the race results came in was was so powerful and it was it, it allowed the mob to extract huge levies and taxes on all the bets that were being made um i think there's this idea that the mob that the when we say that the mob was sort of running the gambling business that meant they actually ran casinos or that they actually ran these like crap schemes that's not what it was they ran the infrastructure that gamblers needed in order to gamble right so they ran things like the wire they you know they were the ones that controlled all the kind of um they built, they made all the gambling equipment, you know, in like mob run factories. I mean, you know, they were smart and that Meyer Lansky was smart in that he figured out he needed to control the, uh, the infrastructure and it didn't matter. Then they could just tax all the like little local games, like what was going on in hot springs. Right. Right. They, they, they always win. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> yeah, the money has to trickle up, you know, money has to flow up. Right. And so they figured that out. Um, we've, we've got a question from Square Books, uh, um, and we'll please submit questions over the chat link at the bottom of the Zoom page, and I'll be happy to, to pass those along to David. Um, and uh, the, the, the question is that, that Dane Harris seemed like a very sharp businessman, um, and uh, what did he end up doing after uh, the casinos closed, after the vapors uh, closed? That's a great question, actually. I, you know, when I first proposed the book, I, I wanted the book to go all the way into like 19, the 1970s, because I thought that the whole next act of Hot Springs with Rockefeller and Lynn Davis and, you know, um, the saga of like how Rockefeller played this cat and mouse to close down gambling. I thought all of that would be a fun kind of, la you know, last chapter of the book. But when I was writing it and I got to Oni's death, I realized that that was the ending, right? And so it was only in writing it that I realized where I needed to end it. And I touch on some of this in the, uh, you know, at the end of the book, but um, but after Dane, after gambling finally gets shut down in, in um, Arkansas, Dane starts a company to run, um, he starts a casino in Istanbul, Turkey. And he partnered with um, the, the guy who started the Holiday Inn hotel chain was actually from, I think Memphis or West Memphis. He was from the area. And um, he, so Holiday Inn was taking off at that point. He was getting pretty big and he partnered, he reached out to Dane with this opportunity that he had to, you know, start a casino in, um, in Istanbul where the government was going to, you know, allow there to be one casino that they ran. And what they didn't have was gamblers. They didn't want to let local people gamble. So Dane ran junkets where he, because he had all these high rollers from his casino and they're like a book, right? So he, he would fly planes filled with gamblers from the United States to Turkey to gamble. And he tried, he managed that casino and managed these junkets for a number of years um, until the government, the Turkish government changed their mind and shut that casino down. Um, and then after that, I mean, and the vapors stayed open. I mean, the vapors was open until 1990, 91. And, you know, it, 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 they, he, tr he was also trying to run the vapors in the hot springs as like a dinner theater, as a, you know, a nightclub. And he still had a lot of connections in the entertainment world. So throughout the 1970s, he was still bringing people like Phyllis Diller and folks back into town to perform to smaller and smaller crowds. And it got more and more expensive, but you know, he was making an effort at trying to keep the vapors running. And then he died in the early eighties. Um, here's a question uh, from uh, Brent. Did writing about historical figures in real life places and events ever make you question your responsibility as an author to write about them as realistically as possible? but to also somewhat protect them. So. Yeah. I guess that's an interesting question. I mean, I, I definitely felt an obligation to, I guess, protect people um, in that I didn't, you know, if there was a moment where, if there was something that I came across that I felt was like particularly like salacious or, you know, maybe felt a little kind of gossipy and it didn't really move the story necessarily. I would leave it out. Right. Because what's the point? And so there were, there were a few things like that and not just with people in my family, but even with Oni and Dane and other people's stories. So I, yeah, I definitely made some choices to not write about things that I thought would, you know, 
maybe hurt people's reputations and also didn't help the story in any way. So yeah, I think I probably made that choice sometimes. And I think I also had to struggle a lot with this question of, um, you know, truth and, and what was true and having to decide what to use and what not to use. And, you know, I mean, we've talked about like, with, with even with the sources that I was working with, I doubted sometimes whether they were true, right? I mean, you and I, before this, we're, we were talking about Maxine's book, right? That um, Maxine Jones, who was a, a famous madam in, uh, in Hot Springs and eventually wrote a tell-all book yeah. and maybe tell more than all, actually. <laughs> <laughs> she's in my book. I mean, I, she's in the book and she's a part of the, a minor part of the story, but she had written her own book, I think in the 80s, right? And, um, yeah. and her book, she changed everybody's name, although I was given, you know, a lot of people in Hot Springs have their own like guide to her book where they have like <laughs> all the, the pseudonyms and the real people's names written. So I had had, I was given one of those by a friend, um, but she changed everybody's names and, uh, and it was a bit of a tell all about a lot, you know, uh, some of the events that are, that take place in book. So I had her book and I, I wonder what, should I use her account of things given that there were so many reasons to doubt it, right? I mean, she had so many reasons in her book to lie and there were plenty of things that I could tell reading were absolute, seemed completely made up. But I don't think everything in her book was a lie. And I think that I could, so I had to sometimes make a decision about what I th saw in her book that I thought I had found enough corroboration in other places that I believed it could probably be true or that I, you know, that I personally believed it was true and then I would use that, right? And so, this is where it gets kind of sticky when you're trying to write nonfiction and you're working with sources that you doubt. I mean, another example of this that a lot of writers that write about organized crime run across is the, this book called the, um, the last will and Testament of lucky to Luciano, which was written by lucky Luciano ostensibly, but it was actually written by his lawyer, right? It was as told to his lawyer. And so there's a lot of historians that say that you, they doubt that anything in that book is true. Well, I'm sure that there's, you know, I'm sure that it's, it, there are plenty of things in there that doubt, but that doesn't mean that everything in the book is untrue. And so you really have to figure out, you have to go to other sources and figure out what has some corroboration or what doesn't. But I think this is rampant when you're talking about writing about organized crime. There's so much of this stuff. And even when you go to the primary source documents, whether it's like, uh, you know, police records and court transcripts and, um, and affidavits and, uh, and newspaper articles, right? You can't always trust those either. I mean, people had plenty of reasons yeah. to lie to journalists. They had plenty of reasons to lie to cops. And so even when I had, was working with a primary source document, I was like, I'm not sure if this is true, right? I don't know that I feel like this is true. So the accounts are always all over the place. And the writer's job, I decided that my job was to not make anything up you know, not to invent anything, but I, but I also had to decide which of these different sort of competing and sometimes questionable accounts I would include in the book or not include in the book. And, um, and that was fine with me. I mean, like I said, I wasn't writing a scholarly history of Hot Springs. I wanted to tell a good story. I didn't, I wanted it to be as true as it could. And that meant it wasn't going to be something I invented in my brain, but it was, um, but all the same, you know, I had to figure some of this out. And so that was tough, you know, and I felt a lot of responsibility to try to get it as right as I could. And I, I still to this day feel very nervous about that because, yeah. because a lot of people who know what really happened are dead, right? And yeah. so. You felt like family members were trying their best to be honest with you, whatever that means for them. Well, you know, with my grandmother, for example, like I remember often when I would sit down with people to talk to them about her and they'd say, I'd tell them I was writing a book about her. They'd say, um, they'd say, oh, your grandmother, you know, she was such a wonderful woman. And she started to, they start to go in and tell me all these like, you know, great stories about her. And, and that'd be, and I'd record that and we'd have that conversation. But when it was over, I'd say, look, I know like what was really going on. So you might as well just tell me that, you know, like I'd have to, <laughs> I'd have to then have the second part of the interview where I kind of reveal to them that I'm like fully aware of, you know, my grandmother's problems as well and her issues as well. And so then people would open up a little bit more and start to tell me, the truth. So people, people I was interviewing were trying to protect her from me, um, not because I was a writer that was going to besmirch her name, but because I was her grandson, you know, mm. and I think that made it harder for me. I think they would have yeah. probably told somebody off the street all the dirty details, but it, because I was her grandson, I think they were trying. So once they realized that I was, um, gonna, you know, I, I was going to write a story about her that was true, but that also like took a full measure of her and her life, right? I think people mm. trusted me to tell me some of the true truth um but that was a hard process and with some folks sure. 
it was it, it was some folks it really took several conversations before I could get them to really open up. Right. Uh, we've got a question from Drew that says uh, he read in your newsletter that there were some books that you were trying to emulate in terms of style and structure. What were those books? Do you, and do you uh, do you have any ones that were sort of either hard or loose models for you? <laughs> Well, I made when when I first got to Arkansas because I lived in Arkansas for a year while I was writing the book. And when I first got down there, I was reading. I was trying to read a lot of like Southern Gothic novels, and I was trying to read Arkansas writers, and I was reading, you know, Portis, and I was reading people that, and I was reading like, um, you know, Ag, and I was reading some Flannery O'Connor and some stuff that was dark and some stuff that was funny, but. But, but across the board, that was a mistake because it, it made me start to think and write in this like weird, like Southern um, kind of, you know, dialect and, um, and trying to emulate, you know, this, this, the style of a novelist. And I think that was probably the wrong move. But what I wrote that, the newsletter I wrote was about, was particularly about um, this book, The Executioner Song, the Norman Mailer book, which I also read when I was in Arkansas writing the book. And I'd never read it before. And I'm not even sure what possessed me to read it when I was down there because it's like 5,000 pages long. But for whatever reason, I, I got turned on to it and I started it and I just was completely bowled over by it and decided that I really wanted to write something like that, right? That I wanted to write a nonfiction book that really made you feel like, you know, you were reading, you, that, that made you feel like you were being told the story by a um, kind of a, you know, a, an omniscient narrator, but at, by the, at the same time was, you know, um, was sort of sticking to the actual story, right? I mean, it's really hard to do. And I don't think that I succeeded at that, but um, because of the, my book, like Mailer's book is, um, you know, there's not any, there's no notes, you know what I mean? There's no end notes. There's no um, references to where he got this or that. I mean, we just sort of take him at his word that, that these all came from interviews he did. But in my book, I really tried to hold myself to like, you know, have a healthy end notes section to show where all of my <laughs> quotes and figures and everything came. And also, I think some of the earlier drafts of the book, I didn't, I left the baby out with the bathwater, right? Like I didn't have enough of the actual um, history, right? There was too many of these scenes, too many vignettes, too many of these like, and I was just stringing together these like interesting scenes and dialogue and, and, and the characters and leaving out some of the history, a lot of the history. And so I, I had to go back in and put that stuff in later. And uh, I remember my editor saying like, look, that's a good thing. He said, often writers will write the history and leave out all the color, yeah. <laughs> you know, and you got to go in in your second draft and add in the, the color. And he's like, you've got all the color. Now you've got to just go add in all the vegetables, you know? So <laughs> that was kind of my process, but, but I definitely was moved by that book. And I, I think that like that, you know, I wanted to write something that was in that style. And I don't think that, you know, I was swinging for those fences. I don't think that I, you know, did exactly that. But I think the motivation to do that helped me write a first draft that gave me a lot of good um, scenes that then I could use to hold the book together when I wrote the book the way it was actually supposed to be. Right, right. All right, we have time for one more question. Okay, there's there's one up here from, from Edward who's... Uh, has a really interesting question about the economics of tourist towns and that the, the, the tentacles of, of tourism, you know, spread through all layers of, uh, of, a, of a town that depends on it for, uh, for its survival. And uh, now that, the, you know, the coronavirus has shut down uh, or had a, a, a real strong effect on a lot of the tourist towns, did anything in your experience of, of being from Hot Springs and in, uh, living in Hot Springs for that time uh, have any insights about, you know, what will tourist towns look like or need to do after the coronavirus to try and build some economic base? Maybe, maybe some of them will go back to, to gambling. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, in some ways, I mean, on the question of gambling, legalized gambling, I mean, you know, that's a little, that's like too little too late at this point because we have 40 something states now that have casino gambling and so the sort of bonanza it would have been in 19 you know 63 to have legalized it in arkansas is far different than what it would be today legalizing it in arkansas right like i think so if we would have legalized it in 1963 i really believe hot springs would have blossomed into las vegas it would have been a you know it would have been there would be billions of dollars there i really think that that's how things would have played out but doing it today just means that you'll have another 
you know, you'll just have this another sort of uh, casino, <laughs> another racino or whatever in town. I mean, it'll be, you know, there'll be some economic development around it in the in the short run. But and I, but but I to answer the question more directly, I I think that the only thing that I could really say that I take away from my experience being there and researching the book that might be um, useful on this question is that is that after they took gambling away from Hot Springs, Hot Springs suffered. I mean, it was a, the, the 1970s and 80s were a real nadir in that city. I mean, Hot Springs has really bounced back a lot. And today it's a, it's a really fantastic place. And I really hope that people will go visit it. But when I was young, I think Hot Springs was really suffering and trying to figure out, trying to find its sea legs because taking that tourist economy away from it like that really just de devastated the city and people left, businesses left. And I allude to this in the book too. There's a scene in the book where you just see what a ghost town it had become so quickly. And it's because the tourists were only coming to town for the gambling. So once you took that away, they weren't going to come back. And so we see that with the, you know, with COVID-19 now too. And I worry that like that period of, of, of building back Hot Springs was a multi-decade process. It wasn't something that happened in like six months or a year. It took 20 years for Hot Springs to get back after gambling shut down. So I think that's probably not good news, but if we're going to learn anything, if we want to look at the lesson of Hot Springs, that's what happened there. Right. Well, gosh, thanks. Thanks a lot for, uh, for writing the book and thanks a lot for talking to everybody today. And thank you all, all of our listeners for, uh, for hearing you talk about a, a wonderful book. And uh, if you haven't gotten your copy already, please, please go out and get it. It's a great, great read. And uh, uh, thank you for, for coming on and chatting with us. Well, thank you. It's such an honor to talk to you about this, Jay. It really is. And uh, thanks well, to thank everybody you. for coming. Uh, and if anyone missed any part of the segment, we are going to be posting the recording of this on YouTube. I'm sorry, this is my kitten. Um, <laughs> uh, you can buy a signed copy of the book from Square Books in the link that I left in the chat. And I will also be sending out an email with a link to the book and our YouTube link. Um, so thank you all so much. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you, David. Thank you, Jay. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.